this video we'll be doing something a bit different in analyzing an old school hand through the modern lens of GTO to observe how the game may have evolved over the years, particularly since the advent of solvers. This hand is from Season 1 of Poker Star's Big Game back in 2010 and is between Daniel Negreanu and Andrew Robel, two players who have managed to sustain substantial success for over a decade which is no small feat. Young Andrew Robel opens the action in the hijack with ace-jack off to $2,500. The structure of this game is $200-$400 with a $100 ante and a $800 straddle. So for the assumed ranges, we'll be using range converters 200 big blind poker master ranges as Robel is the effective stack with around 90k. In some respects, an ante and a straddle are countervailing forces. On the one hand, the ante should incentivize a wider open, but on the other hand, the straddle adds another player that is acting behind and effectively cuts stacks in half. And interestingly, we see that the GTO hijack opening range for this scenario is actually quite close to the GTO hijack opening range in a 100 big blind ante game without a straddle. Ace jack to 2500. One card is possible. You could jack five for Tony. Folds. Lex is out. Six tray suited. Good enough to call for Daniel. Queen Jack for Alan Barry, who folds. It's a little tight, but he has dominated. And Reynolds folds. Also tight. Both guys were out of position to the razor. The action I'm folds very... around to Daniel Negrano in the small blind holding 6-3 suited, which is a prototypical small ball hand, and he calls. As we can see, from a GTO perspective, this hand is an auto-fold from the small blind. This solution doesn't provide for a small blind calling range, but even if we move to the big blind, we see that 6-3 suited is a fold, which is likely due to a number of reasons. For one, calling with this type of hand presents a significant risk when players are left to act since you will likely be forced to fold to most 3-bet squeezes, which is particularly relevant in a straddle game since there is not just one, but two players behind. Additionally, even if there is no squeeze behind, post-flop, these types of low suited connectors can be very difficult to navigate out of position since you are starting each street at an informational disadvantage which significantly diminishes the EV for these types of hands with quote unquote post flop playability. When you completely whiff the board it becomes more difficult to bluff which you'll often be inclined to do with no showdown value since you don't have the benefit of narrowing your opponent's range by virtue of seeing him act first. And when you do connect with the board, it will often be a very marginal hand like third pair or gut shot, which can be severely pressured by the in-position player on numerous runouts. And finally, even when you do hit a big hand like two pair or straight or flush, your opponent has the advantage of assimilating your action into his ultimate decision, making it easier for him to get away from a cooler scenario or to simply check behind when you decide to slow play. In that regard, this is why from a GTO standpoint, these types of suited connectors are typically only opened or called with significant frequency in later positions and when deeper stacked. However, for purposes of this sim, given Negrano's call here, we're going to assign him a range which is similar to the Stratos calling range that does include 6-3 suited. But we're going to make a few adjustments such as lowering the frequency of calling with these lower suited combos and also adding back in a few stronger Broadway suited combos and pocket pairs that GTO advises to 3-bet since a small ball strategy generally tends to do more calling and less 3-betting as we can see from Daniel's pre-flop stats. Razor. I'm very unhappy right now. I'm not going to be able to sleep until after this episode comes out. Check. Negrano checks a flush draw following the flop. And I guess that is an achievement. Robo bets 4,000 with top pair. The flop comes game. ace, king, deuce with two spades, and Robo continues with a 59% pot bet. As we can see, the solver immediately begins polarizing on this board, checking over half its range, but at the same time, primarily utilizing the full pot sizing when it does bet. This appears to be due to the unique nature of the ace-king board. Although the preflop aggressor should have a significant range advantage on this board, you'll often see the solver check with at least moderate frequency on these types of ace-high boards. This is possibly because, similar to a monotone flop, the ace mitigates to a certain extent a large portion of the preflop aggressor's range advantage, such as its stronger pocket pairs and Broadway combos like king-queen suited, which are immediately crushed by even the weakest ace in the villain's range. 
This effect is magnified in the context of a single raised pot where the preflop collar is the big blind or when the preflop collar has a range similar to the big blind as is the case here. Due to the high number of aces in the big blind range, since not only should it carry most of the suited aces, it should also have a healthy dose of offsuit aces as well. And this effect is further compounded when there's also a king on the board since the big blind caller in a single raised pot should also have a number of suited and offsuit king x hands as well. Additionally, when the hero is ahead on this type of board, it will often be difficult to extract multiple streets or sometimes even a single street of value against holdings like under pairs or gut shots, which also justifies checking. On the flip side, the preflop caller should still retain a proportional advantage of stronger aces and kings and sets, which means that when it does bet, utilizing a larger sizing makes sense because there are many aces and kings in the preflop caller's range that will call most bets even with the possibility of being outkicked. To prove this, if we take a look at 184 representative flops in single raised pot in position versus big blind scenarios for a cash game and sort by the full pot size bet, we indeed see that the types of boards where this sizing is used most often are these ace plus broadway boards. And similar to this hand, we see that at the same time, the preflop aggressor is also doing a good amount of checking on these boards as well. So now that we've established that Robo should be mixing his play between checking and betting large here, the next obvious question is how this mix should be allocated. On the value side, we see the solver betting most sets, although it is slow playing some of these aces since they heavily block Daniel's ace-x combos. Robo's stronger aces are also betting here, including a number of ace-jacks, as well as these weaker aces with the flush draw. In contrast, the solver is checking many of these weaker aces without a flush draw, as well as some of these stronger underpairs. These holdings don't really benefit much from protection due to the ace and king already being on the board, so they should tend to want to pot control as they have showdown value but are behind a number of aces in Daniel's range. And for bluffs, the solver bets with a number of these gut shots, flush draws, and random weaker holdings such as lower pairs and suited connectors that have limited showdown value, so attempting to apply fold equity by leveraging the preflop aggressor's range advantage does make sense. He's making Daniel pay to draw. Daniel will. Daniel trying to chase that spade. Daniel calls and we see that the solver is calling with his hand and that is defending with virtually 100% of its flush draws. As we can see, some of the flush draws defend via raising, either with an ace or with these higher ranked combos, possibly due to their marginal blocking qualities against Robo's ace-x holdings. And I think right off the bat, this hints to one of the possible drawbacks of small ball in that you'll often find yourself chasing a draw or defending a marginal pair against a stronger range that has you crushed. Spade. The turn, the ten of diamonds, Robo picks up a straight draw. Daniel misses. Action on Negranu. Looks like we're going to see a semi bluff. That's 8,500. The turn brings the 10 of diamonds, and Daniel leads out with a 57% pot bet. As we can see, the solver is doing basically zero donking here, including with Daniel's flush draw, as this board is dominated by the preflop aggressor's range, which has the proportional advantage in straights, sets, two pairs, and strongest top pairs. Even taking a look at the strongest possible combo here, queen jack of spades with a nut straight and redraw to the second nut flush, we see that betting loses significant EV, which I think exemplifies one of the shifting trends that has emerged with modern GTO strategies. From a GTO perspective, in most scenarios, the solver has a propensity to take lines that flow with the rest of the range. This macro strategy is effective because when an individual holding is played in a manner consistent with a majority of the rest of the range, it keeps as many of the hero's combos in play as possible from the villain's vantage point, which helps disguise its strategy. There are many exceptions to this rule, of course, but this is why you see the solver checking nearly its entire range, the vast majority of time on the flop out of position as the preflop caller. The solver doesn't know who raised or called preflop, and it also doesn't know the human tradition of checking to the preflop aggressor. 
All it knows is that on most boards in this scenario, it will be at a range disadvantage and is acting first with less information, so it checks its entire range as a default, even though in most instances it will have some nuttish individual holdings like sets or two pairs that are ahead most of the preflop aggressor's range. In contrast, when the hero takes actions that go against the grain of most of its range, it will often allow the villain to cleave off large segments of hero's possible combos, thus making the hero easier to play against. So in short, this donk is not really explainable by GTO and appears to be a purely exploitative play by Daniel. If I had to speculate about Daniel's intentions here, he may be using the cover provided by the possible straights the turn brings to essentially set a price to continue so he can see the river with his flush draw in an attempt to realize his equity. And of course, if he gets a fold against something like pocket nines, that would be a victory as well. This is a donk bet bluff. He knows Robel is tight, and Andrew knows Daniel is loose, so top pair, decent kicker, and a gut shot might all just be too much to get away from for Andrew. Robel calls. Andrew calls, which we see the standard play with ace-jack. However, we do see that the solver will punish the donk with a good percentage of its range by raising. We see that it raises most of its straights and sets, and it also throws in a number of bluffs, primarily these third pairs with the gut shot slash straight blockers. We all know Robles' tight rep. Daniel can't like that call unless he sees a spade. Which he doesn't. Ten of hearts on the river. Daniel's got air, but if he wants to win this pot, he's going to have to use that air to blow Andrew off his hand. Feel like that again. Action on the Granu. Amsterdam. That's 18 5. Three tens is a tough bluff to pull off, so Daniel is most likely trying to rep a big ace or maybe a straight. His bet is designed to bluff Robo off a king, maybe. I don't think Daniel thinks he could get Robo to fold a big ace, though. The river pairs the 10, and Daniel completes his bluff with a 58% pot bet. As we can see, the solver is bluffing most of its 6-3 combos here, but it is primarily choosing the smaller 30% pot sizing. On the one hand, Daniel's holding has zero showdown value and is unblocking some of the weak pairs and missed high card straight draws that Robo has in his range, so some type of bluff is warranted. However, on the other hand, holding spades blocks the missed flush draws in Robo's range, and there are some other bluff candidates that might be better here, which would justify a larger sizing, such as these Queen X and Jack X holdings that block the straight. I was so crushed after that final, I could cry. I'm going to walk out. If these guys are going to come here waste my time, I'm going to walk out of the game. It's a joke. F***ing hell, he's thinking 20 minutes every f***ing hand he's playing. F***ing nit. Here comes floor man Tom Keen, who's received more air time than Hoyt Corkins, who went broken eight hands on the big game. All right, Andrew, we're going to go through the same thing. You play online, it's like quick, two seconds, bang, bang, they're pressing buttons. They come here, they freeze up. Daniel's done a good job of making this look like a value bet, so Andrew has a legit decision to make. He seems to be doing a good job of tuning Tony out. He folds. What? Andrew lays down the best hand, and interestingly, we see that out of all the ace-jack combos, this is the one that is folding most often. This is likely because the jack of spades blocks some of the missed flush draws in Daniel's range, and the ace of diamonds doesn't block any of the ace 10 suited combos which may have taken Daniel's line. So Daniel ends up winning a nice pot, perhaps based in part on a read he may have had on Andrew, who is quite young here on national TV, and playing stakes which I'm guessing are higher than he typically was used to at the time. However, not to be results oriented, Daniel definitely took a line from preflop through the river that is quite unconventional from a GTO's perspective and is quite risky as well. I think many others in Andrew's shoes would have called in this spot, which points to one of the disadvantages of small ball, where you are often forced into very marginal spots, putting substantial money into the pot with a weak holding. Spots which are incredibly difficult to navigate unless you have a significant post-flop edge. 
In the current context, I think in most online cash games, a small ball strategy will often be punished by squeezers and players that apply a lot of pressure and cram down the SPR, which diminishes the effectiveness of small ball since it relies on implied odds and cheaply seeing flops, turns, and rivers. And even in live cash environments where players tend to be less aggressive, at least at the lower stakes, the small ball strategy will often suffer due to the higher rake taken at many casinos, which strongly disincentivizes a passive preflop calling strategy. The one setting where the small ball strategy probably has the most relevance today would be in a non-high roller live tournament, which makes sense given that they appear to be Daniel's specialty. However, even then, I think playing this style can be quite tough unless you have particular skill and experience playing post-flop like Daniel has accumulated from years and years of playing countless hands of poker. So that's the video for today. Thanks for watching and until next time, stay balanced.